we are now recording. Let's go from current slide. I'm trying to think if there's any major announcements. The one that I do know is this evening at 7 o'clock, just next door to us here in the Bessemer City uh, Civic Center, is the Miss Lawson State Coronation. Okay, so that will be there at uh, 7 o'clock this evening. I won't be able to be there. I've got class that goes until 7.45. And Ron, you can't go either. Okay, all right, so... Uh, He's in that class. Oh, and now we have. Karen's here. Okay. And the corn is here. All right. And. Tammy, right? Okay. All right, anyone else coming in? Okay. All right. I'm just saying we're in Chapter 2, Polynomial Rational Functions, 2.2 .2, Polynomial Functions of Degree 3 or Higher, and Example 2 on page 126. Any questions before we get started? All right, so here's example two. All it's saying is describe the right hand and the left hand behavior of the graph of each of these functions. So the right hand is what happens when x gets very large positively. The left hand is what happens when x gets very large negatively. What's number A doing? Very large x. Positive large X. Second. Okay. I heard going down. Perfect. Okay. And what's going for very large negative X? A. Anybody? Two choices. I could get. Up or down? Up! Okay, very good. Okay. Now, why is that? Now, here's how I do it. You don't have to do it this way, but to me, this is pretty easy. Okay. Ground rule, the leading term is the one that counts for very large and very small. In between, yeah, these other terms count. But for very large x's, very small x's, the leading term dominates. So, let's just look at the leading term here. And then I'll pick a large x. I really don't pick very large. 10. That's easy, right? And what's 10 cubed? Please tell me. 1,000. And you negate that and you get negative 1,000. That's pretty small. Okay. That's going to negative infinity. Okay. Then pick a a pretty large negative number. And again, I don't go too large. Negative 10. And what's negative 10 cubed? Negative 1,000. But when you negate that, it becomes <coughs> positive 1,000. I think that's going up there, isn't it? There. Pretty easy thing to do. Now let's figure out how to write that and make it make sense, like you'll probably see somewhere in the near future. Okay? Describe the right and left hand behavior of the graph of each function. This is how I like to describe them. Let me get my pen set up. Okay. As x approaches blank, f of x approaches blank. Semicolon. As x approaches blank, f of x approaches blank. Now can anyone tell me what goes in every one of those blanks? An infinity. So go on and write in an infinity. Okay? All right. And here's Katie, right? Yes. Okay. And yeah, I've got it. Okay. 
No, I'm sorry. Look out right. Yeah. Okay. okay. And So, as someone said, in every blank goes an infinity, okay? Now, all that's left is the side the signs, okay? And guess what one of these x's will be? Negative, and the other will be positive. So you got those. So you've got all four blanks at least partially filled in, and two of them absolutely correctly filled in. X shows negative infinity, x shows a positive infinity. Now you fill in the f's. And all you do is figure out what sign to go where. And what was, did we say happened when x goes to negative infinity? What's the f of x1? We just did it. Positive, so leave that alone, okay? As x goes to positive infinity, what is f doing? Going to negative infinity. Put on that minus sign there, you got it right. Now, can it get any easier than that? Okay? This is how you do left and right hand behavior. I call it in behavior of functions. Okay? Let's do number B. Okay? Let me go on and fill in the blanks as x goes to blank, f of x goes to blank, as x goes to blank, f of x goes to blank. Okay? What do I fill in the blanks? Before I even look at the problem, I infinity in every one of them. Okay? All right. And then what do we do for the X's? Always. One negative and one positive. Okay. We got the X's done. So two blanks are absolutely correct. You know that right off the top. Now the question is, what happens to the F of X? First, as X goes to negative infinity, getting very, very small, what happens to this L? What governs it? What determines it? The leading term, <laughs> X to the fourth. And when X is very, very small negatively, say, negative 10, not very small negative, but it's a, okay. What's negative 10 to the fourth power? Say again. 10,000. Positive 10,000. You raise any number to an even power, it's positive. Positive or negative, it's positive. Now, if there's a minus sign in front, that flips it and makes it negative. So if that will be positive, your f of x is perfect, right like that. Right? Because 10,000 is a pretty big number, right? All right, now what happens as x goes positive? Say again? You may have said it, I just can't hear it. Someone said something. This goes up, absolutely. So that one's correct too. Already done it for you, right? Does that make sense? All right, now. Let's do this one. F of x is, whoops, x to the fifth minus x. So we'll do as x goes blank, f of x goes blank. As x goes blank, f of x goes blank. Okay? What do I put in every blank? And infinity, y'all are good, okay? Now let's get our x's right. What goes there? One negative and one lead positive, okay? You got half of them right, right off the top. The other half are probably a good chance that something will be right, okay? Now we figure out what to put, what signs to put for the alphabet. So, what one do we do when this one goes to negative infinity? 
what you can get. There again. Okay. Yep. What what determines where it goes? The leading term, and that's x to the fifth. So pick a negative x. You don't have to pick a very large one. Negative ten. That's not too big. But what happens to that if you raise it to the fifth power? Say again. A hundred thousand. So what sign? Negative a hundred thousand. Because anytime you raise a minus sign to an odd power, it stays minus. An odd power to an even power goes plus. Okay. So this will be. If there's no sign in front of it. So this will be. F of x will be going to. I think a negative a hundred thousand is fairly negative, isn't it? Okay. So that goes negative. How about when x goes to positive infinity? This one. Where's your f doing then? Say again. Good to hear. Hold my set up. Help me. What you think's happening? It goes positive. Of course, any positive number, you raise any power, is going to be positive. Now, of course, it's got a minus sign in front of it. That will flip it. Okay, but that will be positive. 10 to the positive 5 power, I mean, positive 10 to the 5th power is 100,000. That's pretty positive in my book, right? So that goes positive, it's already correct. You see how this works? Okay, it's pretty simple, right? Okay, just think through it well, okay? Now, they're going to show graphs with it to see what it looks like. So let's focus on this first one right now. Minus x cubed plus 4x. Here's how it looks. Normally, an x cubed plus or minus 4x, it doesn't matter, that's going to be negative this way and positive this way. You put a minus sign in front of it and you flip it. So it's going positive to the left for negative numbers, negative to the right for positive numbers. That minus sign flips everything. Make sense? Now, this is pretty typical of a cubic function. Now, what else about this cubic function do you notice? This is from back in the last chapter, but you still need to know. What kind of function is it? Odd function. And what does that mean? reflects about the origin, exactly. When it goes up here, it's going down there. When it's going down here, it's going up there. Odd function, because both of these exponents are odd. Good deal. Okay. The second one, which is x to the fourth minus 5x squared plus 4, that looks like this. Okay. Oh, they have a here. I don't have to go back. Now, because the degree is even, that means the function is going to be going in the same direction, depending on the sign that's in front. And what's the sign in front? Positive. So therefore, it's going to be up and up. And sure enough, it is. Now, what do you notice about this function? Say again. Even function, which means it reflects across. The y-axis, exactly, whatever it's doing on this side, it does the same thing on this side. Does that here, it does that here. Does this here, it does that there. Same thing on both sides. Even function. Okay? Any questions on that? Notice also that all the turning points are smooth. They're none, none of them are pointed. These are awfully close to being pointed, but they're all smooth. Not pointed. No cusp, no corners. Okay, and then the third one. Okay, now they just happen to give you three of similar types. Here, all you focus on is leading term, and the exponent is odd. Okay, the, that means when x goes negative, f of x goes negative, since there's no minus sign in front. 
When x goes positive, it goes positive. So any i is always going to be going in opposite directions. Okay? In even, it's going to be going in the same direction. We don't know which way. And with odds, we don't know which way either until you determine the sign of that leading, uh, leading term. And if that's negative, it flips them. And if it's, or if it's even, it flips them that way. Okay, it just has no negative sign in front, so it goes down for negative, up for positive. Okay, there you have it. And what kind of function is this? Odd function, so it? Oh, across the origin. If it goes down here, it's going up there. If it's going down here, it's going up there. So it does the opposite things on either side of the origin. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. Okay. Now, a couple things we haven't done yet, and let me just point them out now, since we've got some good graphs here. How many zeros does that function have? Three. There's a zero, there's a zero, and there's a zero. It crosses the x-axis three times. What's the degree of that function? Ooh. Ooh. Interesting. Is that just a coincidence? How about this one? Four and four. Ah, interesting. How about this one? Uh-oh, spaghetti -o. What is it? You only have three zeros, but your degree is five. But the principle still holds the degree determines the maximum number of zeros you can have. It may have fewer, but it can't have any more. Okay? So that's something else that leading term tells you. The degree tells you the maximum number of zeros you can have. Now let's go back again. How many turning points does this have? Two. And that's one less than this. How many turning points does that one have? Three. One less than that. And how many turning points does this have? Only two. That's not one less, but the maximum number of turning points is one less than these ones. So this one doesn't have it, but it has fewer than that. Fewer is fine. You can't get any more. Okay? We haven't gotten there yet, but will they be there soon? But those are such good graphs to tell you. All right. All right. He looked fired up this morning. Okay. All right. Here's Jeremiah. All right. Good deal. Okay. Anyone else come in that I didn't catch coming in? Um, Okay. Now, in example two, note that the leading coefficient test, I call it the leading term test, tells you only whether the graph eventually rises or falls to the right or left. Other characteristics of the graphs, okay, such as the intercept, the minimum and the maximum points, they have to be determined by other tests. So this leading term test only tells you in behavior. What happens in the long run? And it's not long looks. Okay. So, we're going to start hitting some of the other things. The first thing we're going to hit, oh, and by the way, there's a checkpoint following example two. Good idea to do that as soon as you can after class. And to get the audio video. And then, by the way, I think I found the checkpoint answers are in the back of the book, but they're also explained at larsonprecalculus.com, an absolutely free website you can go to and, uh, and see how they got the answers for those checkpoints. All right, so now we're going to talk about one of those other issues, what I just sort of brought up, the real zeros of the polynomial functions. Now, let's go back for a moment. This one had three real zeros. That's all the zeros it's got. That one had four real zeros, all the zeros it's got. This one, you were anticipating maybe having up to five. You only had three. Here's a hint. The other two are, oh, this sounds bizarre, imaginary zeros, or complex zeros. They don't cross 
the real number line. Now we want, we're going to talk about this kind of stuff a little bit later, but don't sweat it now. But here's a hint. Those conflicts always occur in pairs. So that's why the difference between 5 and 3 is exactly 2. Because they always occur in pairs. That's as long as all the coefficients are real. And that's all we're going to deal with here. So, um, the real zero is a polynomial. That's why they say real zeros. There are two other zeros that are imaginary. Uh, my uh, wife once had an employee, and uh, she was okay as an employee, but she was a little on the flaky side, I guess. And she was talking one day about, you know, her friend is at the, and she said, oh, are we going to get to meet this person? Not male, female. She said, oh, no, no, no. I mean, he's, he's a virtual friend. <laughs> you know, this is back when internet and all this kind of stuff was fairly young. So from then on, uh, when Karen, when she'd be talking about somebody, she'd say, Karen's like, okay, now is that real or imaginary? <laughs> you know, she meant virtual, but yeah, you know, she was being obnoxious. Okay. Uh, so real zeros of polynomial functions. It can be shown, hopefully we won't have to show it, that for a polynomial function of degree n, the <coughs> following statements are true. Hey, where did this come from? The function f has at most, if the degree is n, at most n real zeros. It may have fewer, but it, the most it can have is n. That's what we were just pointing out in your other graph. Secondly, the graph of f has at most n minus 1 turning points. And that's what we pointed out before too. Turning points are also called relative minima if they're turning at the bottom or relative maxima if they're turning at the top. Uh, and there are points at which the graph changes from increasing to decreasing or decreasing to increasing. Okay. Finding those zeros of the polynomial function, that's what we're talking about here, is one of the most important problems in algebra. Okay? So we're going to spend quite a bit of time finding those zeros, the zeros of your functions. There is a strong interplay between the graphical, the figures we saw before, and the algebraic approaches to the problem. Now, let's start with one. Where are the zeros of a function? We did this in chapter one. When the function is equal to zero. Because what's the function? What's f of x always? y. And where y is equal to zero is the x-axis. And those are your zeros. Okay. So here, these, uh, here are four statements that are all equivalent. When f is a polynomial function and a is a real number, no imaginary numbers here, uh, the following statements are all equivalent. If x is equal to a, is a zero of that function. Okay? x equal a is a zero. Now here's the other statement that means the same thing. That means that x equal a is a solution of the polynomial f of x equals zero. What is f of x? y is equal to zero? Sure. That's going to be where that's a zero of the function. Exactly. So if one of these is true, the other is true. There's that one, that one. Also this, x minus a is a factor of that polynomial f of x. And if you think about it, back when we factored polynomials, then you got the factor, and then you put added a to both sides and said x equal a. That's exactly what we had it. If x minus a is 0, if that's a factor of that polynomial f of x, then x equal a is a solution. Remember, that's what we did. We added a to both sides and got the solution. Okay? And here's the one other. A0 is an x-intercept. X-intercept is where those zeros are. So if any of these are true, all four of them are true. Okay? So we'll, we'll refer to zeros in every one of these ways. Okay? So understand they all mean the same thing. So, Here's example three. Find all the real zeros of this polynomial function. Where would you begin? Set it to zero. Say again? Set it to zero. Okay, good place to start. Set that equal to zero. 
And then what would you do with that? Say again? Minus two. What do you mean by that? Okay. Now, um, if this were an equation that was a linear equation, then, and this was just a two here, you subtract two from both sides. If that's where you're heading, that works only if the maximum exponent is one. The maximum exponent is anything other than one. You really want it to be just like it is now. Everything on this side, zero on that side. Because what's your first step when that maximum uh, exponent is not one? When it's two or higher. What's the output? Oh, yeah. Okay. Can we factor that? Oh, how will that factor? Okay, I'd actually pull out the minus also. Minus 2x squared. And what does that leave us on the... Uh, leave us in the first term. Second, x squared. And then when you pull out a minus 2x squared from the second term, what are you left with? Minus 1. Y'all are good. And that's equal to 0. Now what do you do? Okay. Uh, one of these, yes, that would, that would def definitely work. Okay, this first one though, you first just start, this is called the zero product principle. Do you remember that? It's, well, okay. I kind of like what uh, Lindsay is saying. Maybe I should go on and do it. Let's leave this alone for now. If you wanted to, you could factor the, the monomial term. It's not necessary, but you could. I'm going to go on and do it just for fun. Minus 2 times x times x. Now, most of the time, you're not going to do that, okay? But I'm going to do it this time. Does this one, as you say, unfoil? Or does it factor any further? x minus 1 times x plus 1. I didn't actually unfoil it. I just knew that, okay? Now, what you have now is a series of factors. That's what we did. We factored you got a minus 2, an x, an x, and an x minus 1, and an x plus 1, and the product of all those is equal to 0. Now, what does that tell you about one or more of those factors? If the product is equal to 0, okay, I want you to think real hard now. I want you to think of two numbers that you multiply together, and one of the answers, and the answer has got to be in zero. Can you tell me what two numbers that could be? Zero times any number in the world. Is there any way you can get a product equal to zero without one of the factors being zero? None. None. So this tells you at least one of those has to be zero. Now, can minus two be zero? Not in this universe. Okay, it can. Minus two is not zero. So that means that either... Okay, either x is equal to 0, or x is equal to 0, or x minus 1 is equal to 0, or x plus 1 is equal to 0. Okay, most of the time you won't write them this way. Okay, negative 2 cannot equal 0. Okay, so it's out of there. So these two are exactly the same thing, aren't they? So that's only one possible zero. Zero. How about this one? How can you get your zero there? Add one to both sides. And what does that give us? X equal one. What can we do with that last one? Subtract one from both sides and that gives us X equal minus one. Here we've done. We found three zeros for that polynomial. Okay? Now, I misstated something a little bit before. I'm sorry about that. I said the number of zeros always differs. If it isn't 4, it'll differ by 2. This one differs only by 1. Because one of these is a double zero. I don't know if any of you remember the dumb Bob Newhart show of many years ago. 
where he ran an inn or something like this and had a neighbor and the guy always came around and always had his two brothers follow him. And he said, this is my brother something and my other brother something. He always had the same name, okay? Well, this is a zero and this is a zero, but it's the same zero, okay? Same, never mind, okay. So anyway, when you have a multiple zero like we do here, they still one, two, three, and four. We still add up to four zeros. It's just that that's going one. Okay. So we have three zeros. One of them's a multiple. Okay. So the maximum, okay. Find all the real zeros. We got it. Now determine the maximum number of turning points. What do you think that's going to be? Three. One less than your degree. Okay, so your turning point, the max turning points, is going to be three. Okay? Now, they don't tell us to graph it, but we probably can. They're going to graph it for us. You want to just wait and see theirs, or you want to graph it yourself? Say again? Y'all have no preference on anything, do you? You want to graph it? Huh? Let's graph it. Okay. So, I'm going to, <laughs> let's erase as much as I can, but I want to keep my zeros. Okay. And we want to keep the turning points. So, let's erase that. It's all good stuff. But this is so we will be able to see our graphs better. Those are our three zeros. Remembering that x equals zero is a double zero. Okay? My other brother, Daryl. That was it. My other brother, Daryl. That was his name. Okay. All right. Now. Okay. Now. First thing, let's plot our three zeros. Zero, one, and minus one. Okay? The other thing I want to ask you, <clears throat> looking at what we know now, what's the end behavior of that function? What's it doing right and left hand? Going down, down. Down on the left, down on the right, stand up, stand up. Okay. So, we know that ultimately it's going downhill here and downhill there. Okay? So, here's my, well, you want to plot a few more points? Okay. Here's, a, here's something I'm going to tell you now. Remember this is a smooth, continuous function. If it's going downhill here, that means... Okay, there is a chance it could be doing this kind of stuff, but we've already accounted for all four zeros. So I don't anticipate having any more humps in it because what's the maximum number of turning points? Three. Well, if you're going downhill here, down here, then you anticipate it's going through this point, down here. Now, I know this and you don't know it yet, but I'll tell you why. It's going to touch there and kiss it, but not go, not cross it. Go back up and down. Guess what? That's all the turning points you can have. One, two, three. All that you can have. So therefore, there can't be any wiggles and jiggles over here. Cannot be, because that's the maximum number of turning points. Now, if you wanted to, you could use a test point of negative two, plug that in and see what you get. You're going to get a negative. Because so this is going to be negative 2 to the 4th power is, anyone know? What's going on? Negative 2 to the 1st power is negative 2 to the 2nd power is positive 4 to the 3rd power is negative 8 to the 4th power is positive 16. Multiply that by minus 2, you get negative 32. And then we've already said what that was. That would be a 4 times 2 
is 8, negative 32 minus 8, way down there, okay, all scale, okay? Now you could pick a point in here of one half, but I've already told you, it's got to cross there. And I'll tell you why in just a minute, okay? And it's going to kiss and go back here, I'll tell you why in just a minute. So it's got to be positive here and then there. It's going to be the same thing, including negative. So that's what the graph's going to look like. Where it goes, how tight, I don't know. You can do your test points and see, but it'll be something like that, okay? It only touches there, it doesn't cross. And here's why. Whenever you have a multiple zero, that means it will, okay, multiple zero. If that's an even multiple, it touches but doesn't cross. If it's an odd multiple, it crosses. And guess what? This is an odd multiple. It's only one. So it crosses here, touches there, crosses there. So that's what lets me know it has to be this kind of shape. Okay? Let's see how it looks if they do it. Oh, I've got to erase this. All right. To find the real zeros, Exactly what Ryan said, set f equal to zero, solve for x. How we do that is factor, okay? Remove the largest common multiple factor. I like to drag the sign with it, okay? And then factor, continue factoring, and that's what you get. They didn't do all the little silly stuff I did, but they did the major ones. The first one, the only way that first factor can be zero is if x is equal to zero. So minus 2 is never zero. The only way that one can be zero is if x equals zero. So that gives you x equals zero. The next one gives you x equal one, and the third one gives you x equal minus one, just like y'all found. Okay? Because the function is fourth degree polynomial, the graph can only have at most four minus one, three turning points. That's what you found, and that's what we found. And this is how it looks. Just about like mine did, is they spread out the x axis. And I guess didn't do that for me a lot. So it goes up like this. Now, notice here, single zeros crosses the x-axis. Double zero kisses the x-axis, but doesn't cross it. Okay? Touches, but doesn't cross. We haven't gotten there yet, but that's going to be cool. How many turning points? One, two, three. That's the max you can have, so you know it doesn't do any wiggling and jiggling here or there. It can. That's already the maximum number of zeros. Okay? Good deal. Any questions on that? Some things I've told you, you don't have yet, but we're going to get them really soon. Like right now. Okay. In example three, note that because the exponent is greater than one, this factor here, exponent of two, it yields a repeated zero, x equals zero, and his brother x equals zero. Okay. So, a factor of x minus a, this happens to be x minus 0, okay, uh, raised to the kth power, if k is greater than 1, then what we have is a repeated 0 of x equal a. And we say that is a multiplicity k, whatever that multiplicity is. Ours is 2. When k is odd, like a 3, 5, 7, or something like that, the graph does cross the x-axis there, okay? Now, I want you to think back. Ooh, that's hard. Okay, when we have our linear function, right, it's always going to cross the x-axis one time only, right? Unless it's a horizontal line, then it'll never cross, right? Now, when we have a quadratic function, there are three possible, well, okay, it could be like this. How many times does it cross? Two. It could be like this. Whoa, that's interesting. That's still interesting. Okay. How many times does it cross? Two. It could be like this, 
only cross it, only touches it once, or it could be like, whoops, like this, and only touch it once, or it could be like this, and it never crosses. It could be like this, and it never crosses. Okay? So, this, or this, is when you have a multiplicity of two, because it touches but doesn't cross, these have multiplicity of one. Because a quadratic only has two possible crosses. This, those are imaginary zeros. <laughs> it never crosses the x axis. Okay. Now, that really wasn't what I meant to do, but I thought that would illustrate better. Here's what I was going to do. I'm going to erase all that and start over. Okay. Tell me what your cubic function looks like. Doesn't it start down here, touch here, but then cross? Right? You remember what your quartic function looks like? It comes down steeply here, hangs around here for a long time, then goes up, right? How about your quintic function? That acts just like the cubic, but hangs around here longer and then goes up sharper. Remember? The 6 does, yeah, it's the same thing. Well, anytime you're a multiple, even with 3, it hung around the x-axis 1. If it's 1, it's like that, linear function. If it's a quadratic, it's like this. It crosses, crosses, or it touches and goes back. But anything higher, it hangs around there a little bit longer. The higher the power, the more it hangs around there. So, that's the same thing that's happening here. Remember your cubic function, your n is equal to 3. Your fifth function, n is equal to 5. They all cross, but they hang around there a little longer. Okay? Your even functions, n equal 2 or n equal 4, they come down and touch, but hang and go back up. Okay? Or come up and, yeah, they don't cross. They hang around there. Same thing is happening here. Okay, when k is even, that's, let's see, I want to erase this mess. Okay, when k is even, it touches but doesn't cross, but it hangs around there long. When k is odd, it touches but hangs around there as long as it's greater than 1. If it's 1, it just crosses. But if it's greater than 1, it hangs around there a little bit longer, but then it winds up crossing. The higher that is, the longer it hangs around there, but it always crosses. The higher this k is, the longer it hangs there, but it always goes back. Okay? It touches, but does not cross. Same principle held for your multiplicities as it held for your parent functions. Okay? To graph polynomial functions, use the fact that a polynomial function can change sine square the function itself only at the origin. And that's only when it cross, I'm sorry, only at the, uh, at its zeros. But that's only when it crosses the x-axis. It doesn't change signs if it goes back up. Okay? Between two consecutive zeros, the polynomial can't cross again. It has to be the same sign. Positive or negative. Because if those are consecutive zeros, it can't cross it again. Okay? It's entirely positive or entirely negative. Okay. Learning all sorts of things about graphs of functions, right? This means when you put the real zeros of a polynomial function in order on the graph, they divide the real number line into intervals in which the function has no sign change. No sign change. So therefore, to test whether it's going to be positive or negative, just pick a single point in between those two zeros. Any point in between those two, plug it into the function. If it comes out positive, it's positive. If it comes out negative, it's negative. It can't change in between the zeros. These resulting intervals are test intervals in which you choose a representative x value, that's what I'm just saying, to determine whether the value of the polynomial is positive or negative. Above the x-axis, below the x-axis. That's what we're going to be doing, doing test points. All right.
They're skipping example four, five. Okay, so let's us go back and do four and five. This looks like the best place to do it. Okay, I didn't get out my watch did I? Ah, we got plenty of time. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Here's example four. Sketch the graph of f of x is equal to 3x to the fourth minus 4x cubed. It says sketch the graph, so I'm going to go on and draw the graph, or at least the beginnings of the graph. Okay. Guess what the first thing I'm going to look at? That's a four, by the way. I'm the real problem. I think it's probably a seven. I think that's a four. Make it look a little better. Someone will complain. Report to the dean that I can't write. Okay. Okay. That's probably even worse, isn't it? Okay. Make fun of me. I heard it. Okay. Hopefully that's readable. Kind of. What do you reckon the first thing we're going to do? In behavior, what happens in the long run? Very negative x's. What is this going? Positive. What is it going? Very positive x's. Say again. Leading term, even, on the up and up. You put any number in here, raise it to the fourth power, it's going to be positive. That times positive, it's got to be positive. So we know in the long run, this is going to be positive here and positive there. Okay, that's the first thing I usually do. Now, what's the next thing we're going to do? Set A equal to zero. Good deal. All right. Now what? Factor. Does that factor? Anybody? More. X cubed. And what do you have left in the first term? 3x minus 4 equals 0. Okay, y'all are good. All right, now, what does that tell you? If you got a factor, what do we usually do? Zero product principle. You set each of the factors equal to zero. So either x cubed is equal to zero or 3x minus 4 is equal to zero. Okay, what does the first give you? x equals zero. That's the only way you can have it, okay? And that happens to be a triple zero, multiplicity of three. Okay, how about this one? Okay, you add 4 to both sides, and that gives you 3x equal 4, divide by 3, and you get, as I heard someone say, 4 over 3, 4 thirds. x equal 4 thirds. Okay, let's tick off a few points here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Negative 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, Positive 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Negative 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay, got it. Now, first of these, x equals 0. That's right there. Triple 0 there. Because it's raised to the third power. Next. Where's the next one? Four thirds. That's a little bit more than one, one third of the way to two. So there's your next zero. That's a single zero. Okay? The end behaviors out there, hey folks, you can almost draw the graph just from that. Because you know it can't cross again, so this has to be going up this way, right? 
and it's not ever going to come down again. Okay, over here, now I didn't draw that very well, because this is a triple, that acts like an x cubed. So it comes down here and hangs around that x equals 0 for a little while, but then crosses. It has a cross because it's an odd multiplicity, right? Then somewhere down here, it's going to turn and go back up, and once it goes up, it's a single uh, z multiplicity, single zero, so it's going, got a cross, and there it's on its way up again. That's it. You can almost guarantee that's how it's going to look. Now, where is a depth? We're not sure, but it's not hard to find out. What test point might you choose? What test point might you choose? Yes, x equal 1. Let's just plug it in. Let's see, we've got things written on it. Okay, when x is equal 1, f of 1 is equal to what? Say again? I think you were saying it. Okay, let's, let's plug it in. 3 times 1 to the 4th power minus 4 times 1 to the 3rd power, right? What's 1 to the 4th power? Okay, so that would be 3 minus 4 equal negative 1. Okay, so there it is right there. I missed it a little bit. Okay, it comes down and crosses there. It may dip below. It may have dipped and be on its way back up, but it's got to be going up after that. Okay, so that doesn't tell you everything, but it really tells you enough. That's where the function's going. Okay, we knew that already because of our n behavior, the multiplicity of our zeros. You know it had to be crossing. It had no choice but being like that. All right. Can I race? Anyone need that a little longer? Okay. Pretty exciting stuff, isn't it? Okay. Oh, wait. <laughs> Sorry. This is the other problem. You have to look in your book to see what you get. And here's what you get there. They did a bunch of, this is example three, they did a bunch of test points, okay, and look at what it came out with. Just like we did. It comes down here, hangs around zero a little while, but crosses, comes down to minus one, and then crosses here and goes up forever. Okay? So sure enough, that's the graph. Use all the tools in your belt. End behavior, leading coefficient test, finding your zeros, test points, use them all. Okay? There is a checkpoint there, as after every example. Please do that shortly after you leave class. All right. Let's go back and do, or let's continue and do example five. All right. Sketch the graph of this polynomial function. F of x. Oh, this looks like a juicy one, doesn't it? Negative 9 halves x plus 6x squared minus 2x cubed. Yeah. I'm sorry, uh, what are we going to do with that? You have several options to begin with. What would you like to do? Say again? Okay, I like that idea. Put it in standard form. So let's just flip it around. What would that be then? Negative 2x cubed plus 6x squared minus 9 halves x. 9 halves x, got it. Okay. Now, sort of a big boo hiss here, okay? What is it you don't like about that? The fraction, okay. So you know what you can do? Factor the fraction out. You can also factor other stuff too. What's the one other thing you could factor? Say again. A negative and a x, right? Okay, I couldn't hear. Sorry, I say yes. Okay, all right, all right. 
Let's factor out the minus one-half x. That's what you're factoring out. Now, what factoring is, is sort of like dividing, right? So, if you divide a negative one-half into a negative two, well, negative into negative is positive. Okay? I like that. One-half into two, that would be basically... 2 divided by 1 half is the same as 2 times 2 over 1. That's going to be 4. Believe that? No. Y'all are skeptics, aren't you? Will you buy it for a moment? Okay. So that'll be 4x squared, right? Agreed? Okay, let's do the same thing with this. Minus will go into plus how many times? Not times, but minus. Get the sign there. And then one half into six. That would be six divided by one half. Anyone want to guess what that would be? Say again? No one guess. Twelve. That would be six times two over one that would be 12. So that would be minus 12 what? X. You factored out 1X, you have 1 left. Okay, and then the last, minus will go into minus plus you factored out the 1 half, so the denominator's gone, you factor out the X, so all you got left is 9. All right. That was rather strange, but it's true. Okay? If you don't believe me, go back and distribute. So let's do that. Negative one half times four is. Just don't worry about the sign yet. Minus times plus is minus. Okay, we got that. One half of four is two. There's the two. And x times x squared is x cubed. Okay, the first term work. How about the next one? Minus times minus is plus. That's okay. One half of 12 is 6. That's okay. X times X is 8 squared. That's all right. Okay, let's do the last one. Minus one half or minus times plus is minus. One half times 9 is 9 halves. X times 1 is plus. Yeah, it worked, didn't it? Deal. Now, what might you need to do? One factor is going to be, oh, 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 you didn't tell me what to do to it. Oh, set it equal to zero. Okay. All right. Now, negative one half x, that's a factor. Okay. Don't throw it away, but we're done with it for now. Okay. How about that? Next? Can that be factored? Okay, someone said yes, I think. What would it be? Say again. 2x, did you say? Say yeah. Okay. What would be the next one? 2x minus, I heard. What number? Three, I thought I heard. Times 2x minus 3. Hey, that's a perfect square, a trinomial, isn't it? The first term's a perfect square, the last term's a perfect square, and the middle term is twice the product of their square root. 2x minus 3, twice that would be well, okay, the product of that would be 2x minus 3 would be minus 6x, double that, you get minus 12x. Perfect square trinomial. So it's the square of two binomials. X minus, uh, 2x minus 3 times 2x minus 3. Okay, now what do we do? We factor completely, and now we set each of them equal to 0. 
minus 1 half x equals 0, or 2x minus 3 equals 0, or 2x minus 3 equals 0, right? Now, what would be your solution for the first one there? Only way that negative 1 half x would be 0 if it's x is equal to what? What? 0! In other words, multiply both sides by minus 2. Minus 2 times 0 is 0, right? x equals 0. That's the only possibility there. How about the next one? Say it a little louder. X equal three halves. Y'all are good at this. How about the next one? Say again. It's the same thing. X equal three halves. That's a double root, isn't it? Okay. You see how we got those? Well, I didn't do all the steps. You see how we got them? Add three to both sides, divide by two. Okay? Works the same way on both of them. So, there are zeros. Let's sort of do our graph here if we can. One, two, three, four, five, negative one, two, three, four, five, negative, pop, negative one, two, three, four, positive one, two, three, four. Okay. What do you think I want to look at first? Again. In behavior, and what's that going to be? Especially since Rachel has put it in standard form. Look at that leading term, and what does it tell you? Okay, you said up to the left. Is that what you said? Yes. Okay, I've got to make sure. Up to the left. Down to the right. Stand up, sit down, fight, fight, fight. Okay, got it. Now, that's what M behavior tells us. It's going in opposite directions because it's an odd exponent. And we're normally it'd be going down to the left and up to the right because the minus sign just flips it. So it's up to the left and down to the right. Good deal. Okay? Next, let's put our zeros in. Where are they? Zero, zero, and three halves, zero. That's a double zero. Okay. Now, it can't have any more zeros out here. We've accounted for them all. Maximum exponent is three. You had a double zero here and a zero and a single one there. That's your three zeros. It can't have any other wiggling and jiggling around. So this is going up this way, right? Whoops, I drew it in the wrong place. Ignore that. Okay. All right. It's going up this way. And it has to come back around. But because that's a double zero, what does it do? It touches it, but doesn't cross it. And then it's going downhill after that. There's your graph right there. Without doing a single test point, that's how it's going to look. Easy to do a test point. What's one that would be pretty simple to do? One again. Okay. Let's try one. Okay. F of one would be, I really like one. The only one I like better than one is zero. Okay. But one will be just your coefficients. Minus nine halves because x is one. Plus six because x is one and x squared is one. Minus 2 because x1 cubed is 1. Okay, so this is going to be 2 is 4 halves, so this is minus 9 halves, minus 4 halves, plus 12 halves because 6 is 12 halves, right? Well, these add to be minus 13 halves, right? And this is plus 12 halves. So I obviously got a little carried away there. This comes out minus one half. So it should be right about there. So I did my dipped a little too much there. Okay. Now that doesn't have to be the minimum, but it looks like somewhere around there. 
okay? But, let's see what it looks like in the book. There's those zeros, where the price is allowed, falls to the right, zero, 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 that's three halves, that's a double, that so comes down here up on it. Why has it been minus one there? Is that right? Did I do something wrong? I don't think so. I think that's supposed to be a minus one half, not minus one. But anyway, the shape is right. The shape is right. All right, any questions? There is a checkpoint. I take it by the motions I'm hearing. There must be running out of time. So we'll start next time with intermediate value theorem on the top of page 130. Let's get some homework exercises for the weekend. You don't want to be... Have the, oh, we almost finished this section. We're close. So let's do... I would do... If I were you, I would do all 9 through 14. I know that the answer's in the back and at, at Calc Chat. They only have the odds, but you can do all... all what is that? Six of those. Okay? It's just matching these graphs with those functions. Okay? Then do either 15 or 17. They're all at Calc Chat, both at Calc Chat. 17 is at Calc U. Then you can do any of the odds 19 to 27. They're all at Calc Chat. 21 is at Calc U. You can do either 29 or 31. They're both at Calc Chat. You can do any of the odds 33 to 47. A whole bunch of those. They're all at Calc Chat. 43 is at Calc U. You can do either 40. 9 or 51, they're both at Calc Chat. Uh, boy, number 53 to 61 is different, but they don't have any examples like them that I know of. So try to do those. If you can't figure them out, bring those to class and we'll work at one or two of those. They're all at Calc Chat. They, well, Calc Chat will tell you how to do them, and Calc View will show you how to do them. Number 59 is at Calc View. And then same thing with 63 to 69. They're all at Calc Chat. 67 is at Calc View. If you can't figure them out, bring them to class. Okay, use Calc Chat and Calc View first. Uh, then any of the odds, 73 to 83. They're all at Calc Chat. 73 is at Calc View. Um, 85 or 87, they're both at Calc Chat. And we'll stop there and pick up the rest of those later. Good deal. Have a good weekend. Y'all have a tournament at Gaston State? Yeah. Do well? How's it going so far? You have what? Yeah, it's Gaston State, right? Yeah. Tomorrow and Saturday. Yes, sir. Yeah. Do well. Thank you, sir. All righty. Good deal. We will catch you on.